All right, as you can see, our team over in the Ivory Coast are doing well. There's a lot of good work going on over there. There's lots of updates on Facebook, on our Facebook page, and on the 1040i Facebook if you want to get more information, see more pictures of what they are doing there. Today, Tim preached at one of the villages that he normally goes to on the, on the Sunday in the middle of the mission, uh, and he baptized 10 people after the service, which is great. He does this every year. And he baptizes them in a bathtub, so it's, he doesn't have to get wet. He just like, dunks, dunks them in a bathtub, so... Um, so that's good. So things are going well over there. So just keep them in your prayers as they continue to do what they are doing, uh, because a lot of good work is going on there, and we want that to continue. Um, I realized last week that I tempted you with these delicious Girl Scout cookies and did not give you the opportunity to buy any. <laughs> so we fixed that oversight this time, and there are some Girl Scout cookies available for sale in the Children's Center, in the foyer of the Children's Center, which is the building by the playground over there. So if you want Girl Scout cookies, please go in there and buy them afterwards. They're $5 a box. This has nothing to do with church ministry. It has nothing to do with supporting anything in the church other than there are 13 girls in one troop in our Sunday school, and they all want to be able to sell Girl Scout cookies here. So it's not just for the benefit of my kids, trust me. So um, Two of them happen to be mine. That's all I can say. Huh? I want to get them out of my house. So you're doing me a favor. The more you buy, the less it ends up in my house. So that's good. Um, anyway, so that's an opportunity to support Girl Scouts if, if you would like to. Um, the senior luncheon on Tuesday, there is a sign-up that will go around. I'll send the sign-up around now. Let me just cover what's on here. Senior lunch is on here. Grief share is starting uh, on Tuesday, February 26th. So that's on here as well. There's the high school Mexico letters. If you would like to support uh, high school kids or youth going to Mexico and you would like to receive a letter asking for support, then you can put your name on this list. We're, just, we're not randomly just sending them to people now. Uh, if you would like to be part of that, they would be happy to send you a letter. And then the Wednesday women's Bible study is starting up again on March 23rd with uh, a study on 10 women from the Bible. So that's also on here on the sign-up sheet if you would like to sign up for that. But the luncheon on Tuesday, senior luncheon, I just want to clarify a few things with that. So we've got, um, it's called the, uh, what is it, we're calling it the uh, Choose a Youth, which sounds different, but so what it is, is uh, there's, there's going to be a board with pictures of all, of all youth people that attend on Sundays, and what, as a senior, you would like to do is just say, I'd like to choose that youth, and I'm going to pray for that youth. I'm going to maybe send them a note, which will be supplied through New Hope, and perhaps just go meet them on a Sunday morning, just so you can say, I'm praying for you, I'm supporting you, and this is kind of a way of connecting the two, these generations together, uh, really in a, just a spirit of support and encouragement between generations. It's, it's no more than that, really, than just uh, being able to put a face to a name and say, you know, I'm praying for you, or maybe as they go to Mexico, send an encouraging note with them to Mexico, uh, maybe share Bible verses with them, that kind of stuff. So that's, if you choose to do that. If not, that's, that's no big deal either. But anyway, it's $5 for food, it's not a potluck, so sign up for that and we will get enough food, make sure we have enough food for everybody. Uh, Prison Fellowship are taking bikes uh, and bike parts next next weekend. So next Sunday, if you have an old bike that's cluttering up your garage and you've been thinking, I need to get rid of this thing, or it's rusting, or it's falling apart, or you have parts of bikes that are hanging around in your garage, you want to clear it out, now is your opportunity. We're doing you a service right here because you can bring this stuff over here and we will make use of it. Prison Fellowship will take it. They will take it to Valley, Prison, Valley State Prison in Chowchilla. They will restore the bikes. They will use parts to restore other bikes that they have, and they give them to kids and to youth. So uh, this is a very worthwhile thing. They've so far they've given 225 plus bikes to kids in the Madeira and Chowchilla area that have just come from restoring old bikes and using old parts to put together the bikes. So that's really worth doing. Next weekend, if you have bikes, bring them over and Fred from Prison Fellowship will take them and use them. Uh, Widow's Lunch Bunch is next weekend. There's details in the bulletin. Uh, we talked about the 10 year anniversary. Anybody is welcome to, to come to that for Celebrate Recovery. Please do. It'll be an exciting evening and it's an exciting time for everybody that's involved in Celebrate Recovery. So we do want to make sure that we, we have a big celebration for that and there will be food. Um, that's always good. Try to. It, so. Very tempting. Um, Fawn is selling, t uh, well, she's taking orders for t shirts out there for the women's retreat. Uh, also, if you're not on the women's retreat, you also want to buy one of those t-shirts, then she'll take an order for that too. It's not a requirement to go on the retreat. And on the video, there was kind of a weird edit there, and it sounded like she said free t-shirts, but then she said $15. It was a strange cut. It sounded like, but I think she said retreat, but it got edited a little bit weird, so. They're not free, they're $15, yeah. 
just thought I'd clear that up because I heard free and then it said $15. And I was like, well, that's strange. But um, anyway, so uh, before we get into prayer requests, I, we're going to watch a video during the offertory, which is a video that was made locally for the organization Safe Families for Children. Today, nationally, is Safe Families for Children Day. And this is a chance for all churches and ministries to m focus on this Safe Families organization that is across the world, but uh, primarily uh, in the U.S. And so Safe Families, really, if you haven't been around, I think last summer I started talking about it, and it's, it's, an, it's an organization that basically is preemptive foster care. If there are a situation where parents have children uh, in their lives and they are trying to get themselves back on track, if they are trying to improve themselves, if they're trying to get themselves in a better situation, but it's difficult time period and their kids are just not safe or they're not you know, able to be around at that particular time, then they can approach Safe Families for Children. At that point, Safe Families will place them with a host parent and there's still contact between the parent and the child. This is not like foster care where a lot of times it's separated, uh, but it's, it's before things get so bad that CPS has to get involved and then that whole system starts to do what it does and sometimes it can be very damaging to relationships. So this is kind of an opportunity to host a, a child and it's usually short term, it's usually anywhere from a couple of days, maybe even one day, to a couple of weeks. I haven't seen any so far that have been more than three weeks, so uh, it can be very short term. Host families is what we're looking for, but we're also looking for family friends, and those are people that maybe just offer to babysit, maybe just offer some support, come visit, play with the kids, that kind of stuff. And then resource friends are people that just bring stuff that you need, like if you have a baby in your house, and you're not used to having a baby in your house, suddenly you need a lot of stuff that you didn't have before. So a resource friend is someone that would just help with things that are needed in the house to help um, take care of this child. Safe Families is a great organization. I've been very involved with them over the last six months, uh, and I really believe in what they're doing, and they're expanding in this area. So the video that we're going to watch during offertory is done on a local level. This is a local testimony uh, here in Fresno area. So uh, this is not just a national video that's been rolled out. If you would like more information about Safe Families, uh, please contact the office or contact me by email and I will give you everything that you need uh, in order to figure out whether that's something you're interested in. So that will be the video uh, that we're going to share uh, after prayer. So uh, prayers today. Mike Rood's uh, mom passed away yesterday morning, oh, the day before yesterday. I think it was um, Friday morning. but. Uh, so just keep that family in prayer. She was 92. Um, so that just, and you know, Mike is very much, you know, she's with my father and she's with Jesus. And that's, that's you know, the attitude that we have uh, when we know that there's hope beyond this life. Um, Irma, <clears throat> we talked about Irma last week. She was in hospital, then she was not in hospital. And, now, and then she was back in hospital again this week. And it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride for the family. And they're here today. And uh, you know, we just, we need to keep her in prayers. You know, she, she was in hospital and doing <clears throat> not too well at all. The, things were very, very difficult uh, for her at that point. And then they kind of treated her, turned it around a bit, and they're working with Stanford, which is where she's been getting cancer treatment. Uh, so they're really working together to try and figure out what's going on with her. But she is resting at home right now, which is great news. So we just keep, keep praying for her, keep praying for the family, uh, for strength in their life as they kind of go through this roller coaster ride. Uh, that's that's been this week. So, you know, just keep keep praying for strength for them. Then there's uh, Dan Sullivan. Dan Sullivan has been <coughs> treated for uh, colon cancer, and they did a, a liver biopsy uh, this week, and he's in a lot of pain. So he's not here this morning. They are actually in the hospital today because he's in a lot of pain from that biopsy. So please pray for them uh, today and ongoing throughout uh, this particular chapter in their life. Also, the Farris family. Uh, we did a memorial service yesterday in here for the Farris family. Uh, so keep them in prayer. That is uh, George Mannon, who was a long-term member of this church. He, he, he passed away last year. His service was last year. It's his son's father-in-law. So that's why we have that here. Um, anyway, great family. So just uh, please pray for them as they deal with the loss um, of, of a father and a husband in that family. Um, okay, so we will pray. And if uh, ushers could come forward for the offering, I'd appreciate it. Um, and then we will get on with the rest of worship, which was awesome this morning. So, okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are just grateful for all of the provision that you provide for us in your life. Your hand we see in everything that we do, and we, we just give thanks for, for all that you provide for us. 
The provision's overwhelming. Everything that you do has a purpose in our lives, and we ask for wisdom to be able to find this purpose and to be able to move through life uh, with, with intentionality so that we can further the kingdom of God through our own lives and to give all glory to you. We know that you provide also through your word protection, and we're thankful that you can protect us in all that we do, put this wall of protection around us. We just pray that we will not damage it, that we will, that we will embrace it, and understand that even though bad things happen, it's still you that is surrounding us at all times. So Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you for the, the gift of your son, for the love that you showed to us through giving us your son and his sacrifice so that we could be forgiven for all that we, all that we do in life. And so we just ask for forgiveness for everything that we do. And we pray today for Irma and we pray that she will be strengthened through you as will our family. We just, we just ask that Dan's pain be reduced today. We ask that doctors will find, will find things that they've been looking for in, in all of these people's lives and find answers that they need when they need them. And so we just give thanks for such excellent medical care in this area and all those that work in those environments. So Lord, we just pray for the Farris family as they deal with the loss of a husband, the loss of a father and a grandfather and a great-grandfather. So Lord, we just lift them up to you uh, in, that, in this time of need. Lord, we thank you for all that you give us, the provisions, and we just ask that we give with great joy to your kingdom's work. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like when I first heard about it, I was like, I was like, wait, I'm going to go live with somebody else that I don't know? It's a stranger. And like, I didn't know what to think. Like when it impacted me that I was going to be living here for a while, like I was going to not be with my family or with anybody for like a couple months. It was just like, these are going to be my new like relatives, these are going to be my new parents and stuff like that. And it kind of, kind of just got to me. I didn't know if I was like ever going to see my mom again or something like that. I didn't really know. We have been working with safe families. They've helped us when we didn't have anybody to help us with a place for my son to go and we were told about Aaron and Leland. Ethan was definitely lost when he first met them. We were going through court and all of this stuff and he wasn't seeing his siblings and Leland and Aaron brought him into their home and just took him in like their own and made him feel like he was worthy. Going into it, we were a little bit um, curious how it was all going to play out. We both work and we both have schedules and it was kind of an indefinite amount of time. We've never parented um, a 12 year old boy before and it turned out to be one of the best things that happened to us. It was just a really impossible situation. I was being torn in half, and they were with me the whole time, letting me know it was okay and that they had him. These were not my blood, but they were, and they still are, just as close to me. And I mean, it's, it's amazing that there's people out there like that that just want to help. When I got here, when I first saw them, I'm like, okay, that guy looks like he knows nothing about sports, and she looks like she's not fun at all. And then when I started to meet him, I'm like, oh wait, he knows stuff, and she's actually cool. When you look at somebody, you just don't, just don't assume, don't like judge them. The entire time I've been here, they, they were just like really nice. Well, I think the real purpose of Safe Families is being there for people who don't have anyone. I mean, when, if I get into trouble or an issue happens, I have so many people to turn to. There's a lot of people in our community that literally have no one. So just being available for them, um, I think is the biggest purpose. You know, I think it's almost our responsibility, but also our privilege to mm -hmm. be able to kind of share that with strangers, with our community. And you really do get to understand a little bit more about what your community has done for you and how you ended up where you're at. Yeah. When you get to be that for somebody else. Well, for me, the value of safe families is in that they're helping us do what the church is supposed to be doing. Why wouldn't we be a part of this? 
This is something that you can be all in and without reservations because this is something that came from the Lord. This was a, a God idea. This is not a good idea. This is a God idea. And uh, I would really challenge uh, pastors who are, are considering this to not wait too long because there are people who need us and we get to come in and be the church and Safe Family helps us fulfill part of that mandate to be the church. All right, well today I'm um, going to do something a little different. And it may start off a little bit that we're going down a pathway and you're wondering where on earth I'm going with this. So I'm just going to ask you to bear with me, indulge me just a little bit. Sometimes it might be feeling like we're bordering on the irrelevant, but I promise at some point we will get back on, on a path that will make some sense as to why I'm delivering this message this morning. So just uh, keep that in mind as we go through the sermon this morning. So the sermon this morning is called Flying Blind. And I gave it this name because really you will find out more about flying than you probably ever wanted to know or probably ever cared about. And that's why I'm just asking you to bear with me on this. For those that don't know, I'm a commercially rated pilot. In my former life, I was a flight instructor. And, um, and actually, if you haven't been around New Hope too long, then you, you probably don't know that I founded and continue to run a nonprofit, an aviation-related nonprofit called Aviation in Action. And uh, we basically do three things. And this is my opportunity to plug this because I, I have the microphone today. So. <laughs> Um, so we do basically three things. The first is that we focus on education, education of kids that are coming out of high school, kid, young people that are just passionate about aviation. We want to help them to get some education, help them to get into uh, a plane, to experience what it's like, to get some ground school going, and I want them to be able to get a first foot on the rung of a career in aviation if that's what they want to do, because many of them have no resources whatsoever. They have no access to resources. Uh, but they do have the passion, and that's what we want to try and capture. We also want to do the same thing for veterans. Veterans get benefits from the VA to pay for commercially rated uh, licenses for flying, but they don't get any money at the beginning, and they have to have a private pilot certificate at the beginning. So we want to scholarship that for the veterans so that they can get that first step, and then they can get their benefits to kick in. Uh, we've also done over 100 medical missions, where the medical missions are when we fly people from here or other places around to the Bay Area, to Stanford, or down to Southern California, to UCLA, to Cedar sinai where they get treatment. A lot of these people have a lot of trouble traveling that far. They don't have transportation that's reliable. They don't have the money to go fly there. So a lot of them just skip the treatment, which they so vitally need uh, to keep them alive, frankly, some of them. And so we help them with medical flying as well um, to get to where they need to go for treatment. And then the third part is we have a three-year plan that we will put a missionary in the Ivory Coast with an airplane who's also a mechanic, so he's a pilot mechanic, and he will be able to support 1040i while they're there, the leadership of 1040i, so that when Mike Cousineau goes over there, he doesn't have to spend a day traveling to Doropo and then a day traveling back. He can be up there in an hour and 20 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes back, and he can use his time much more efficiently while he's there. But when 1040 isn't there, other organizations are there, and they need support as well, and pastors that are church planting and anything like that, we will help support by having a pilot in country with an airplane. That's our three-year plan for aviation in action. So we obviously need people to help us with that. We need finances to help us with that. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, I know there's a building thing going on, and I don't want to interfere with that. But if that's something that you feel interested in, just let me know, and I will give you a lot more information on how that all works. So that's what we are doing uh, down at Fresno Chandler right now is where we're based um, for that. So, But we're going to start off with one fact, and the fact is that I can promise you one thing about life is that it will not always be a smooth ride. In case you haven't noticed yet. <laughs> it's not a case of whether we are going to encounter storms. It's a case of when are we going to encounter storms. When is that going to come along? We just don't know. But the real question then is how will we navigate through those storms? What will we do to help navigate ourselves through all the trouble that comes through in life? General Jimmy Doolittle Probably a lot of you are familiar with the name Doolittle. Um, he's most remembered for his daring bombing raid over Tokyo four months after the Pearl Harbor attack in Hawaii. If you're not familiar with that, the Doolittle Raiders, as they were known, 
took 16 B-25 bombers and they took off from an aircraft carrier. And just think about this for a second. Bombers, you probably think, okay, they took off from an aircraft carrier. This is B-25 bombers. These are big planes. They are not designed to take off from aircraft carriers. So Jimmy Doolittle decided that he was going to do this. This was his project. And um, so he went to the USS Hornet. They put 16 of these bombers on the, plane, on the aircraft carrier. They took off without the aid of fighter escorts. And during World War II, you know, this was a very hazardous mission. 16 B-25s is not difficult to notice on radar, and it's not difficult for people to understand you know, that they, they need to attack this. So they're going over Tokyo. They bomb military targets in Tokyo. And then the idea is that these 16 bombers would land in China, which was probably their best bet at the time in Asia. Well, amazingly, 15 out of the 16 B-25 bombers after the attacking um, after the attack did land in China. They didn't land very well, they crash landed most of them, but they did land in China. Very few of the crews were lost during this time period, and um, the last one, the 16th one, ended up landing in Vladivostok, Russia. And eventually, the Russians sort of took that as a prize and eventually gave back the airmen to the US. But uh, that was what he was most famous for, and because, um, you know, you couldn't land a B-25 back on an aircraft carrier. It's hard enough taking it off. So that was a one-way trip for these guys that went on this particular mission. So Jimmy Doolittle, a little crazy, but it worked out in that case. But what I want to focus on specifically about him today is a little bit further back than that. 1922, he became the first pilot to fly across the United States in less than 24 hours. And he picked a day for that that seemed like it was going to have beautiful full, full moon, everything was going to be good. He was going to use the light of the moon to fly across the country, uh, but that didn't quite go according to plan. So there was clouds that came and he had a particularly bad storm at one part in the US, so he ended up in clouds in the, in the night. So it was complete darkness, complete blackness for several very dangerous hours during this flight. Luckily, he had what was called the turn and bank indicator. It's a very basic instrument inside his airplane, which basically saved him. He said, although I'd been flying almost five years by the seat of my pants and considered that I'd achieved some skill at it, this particular flight made me a firm believer in the proper instrumentation for bad weather flying. Flying with just instruments at that time, in 1922, was pretty rare, and it was a new thing that was starting to come about. But without the indicator that he did have, he would have been forced probably just to bail out because he couldn't see anything for long periods of time. Or he would have just lucked it through, as they called it back in those days. Just give it a shot, see what happens. So, but he figured that there had to be a better way to be able to do this. And he, he, he then said after that, progress was being made in the design of aircraft flight and navigation instruments and radio communication. And if these sciences could be merged together he thought that flying in, weather could be in bad weather could be mastered. So the right mix of instruments inside the airplane could give him the direction that he needed no matter what the weather was like, no matter how dark it was. And it took several years before he figured out the correct combination of radio and gyroscopes to come up with instruments that they put in the plane so he could fly no matter what the visibility was. And he proved that back in 1929 by flying a plane that had a completely blacked out cockpit, just using instruments only. So, if you didn't think that was technical enough, now we're going to get into some technical stuff. But I've got slides today. I went to no, you know, <laughs> no trouble at all. I just, we're not really geared up for slides, so we're going to see how this works out. So, so we get into some technical stuff. We're gonna, if you've ever wanted to, has anyone wanted to learn to fly near? Has anyone ever wanted to learn to fly? Okay, there's a few people. Okay, we're going to cover some ground today. So this is like a first ground school for you in flying. <laughs> Does anybody have a pilot certificate? Is there any pilots in here? Okay. So you're going to do fact checking for me, okay. So, so when you get in an airline, you fold yourself up into the airline seat and you put your head on the pillow and then you wonder whether they really clean them or whether they just put them back on the plane. <laughs> then you open the blanket and it smells kind of funny. You're like, I don't think they washed this, they just put it back in the plastic. So these are the situations when you fold yourself into a seat that, that you are worrying about. But what you're blissfully unaware is that in the office at the front, the cockpit, the pilot's office, there are, t there are periods of time when they're flying where they cannot see anything out of the front window, and they're traveling pretty quick. So they're traveling through the air really fast. They cannot see at all what's in front of them. There are periods of time. I'm not trying to scare you into flying. <laughs> we, just need, we need to work through the whole thing, and then you'll understand where I'm going with this. But. So anyway, so you're blissfully unaware of this as you are sitting in your airline seat. So, 
they could be flying along with a view for miles and miles, and then suddenly there are clouds, and they have nothing to look at except for gray or white or blackness, whatever the time of day happens to be. They might be able to see a whole bunch of water just streaming over the windshield, because that's what happens when you fly through clouds. Um, and it looks something like this, and they have first slide. The first slide that we have, when you're flying through a cloud, it looks like that. And obviously that's not an airline, that's a much smaller plane, but that's pretty much what you see out of the window, nothing. So you are what you might say flying blind at that point. As we found out with the story of General Doolittle, there are instruments and gauges inside the aircraft that know you, let you know exactly what is going on during this flight, and you, but you have to know how to read them, otherwise you will not have a very good flight. The basic instrument gauges on an airplane are, there are a lot more, those, this is very basic, so they're a lot more advanced now. You get in the average airplane that's not small, even the smaller ones now, and they have a computer screen and everything's computerized, everything's autopilot and everything is... It just does it all for you, which is no fun. So we're going to stick with the old school, the old school basics. Um, so when you sit in the front of an airplane, you have basically six gauges in front of you, right in front of you. And this is what we call in the piloting world a six pack. And this is much easier six pack to get than the one on your body because you just need money to get this one. <laughs> it doesn't take a lot of hard work. So if you put the next slide up, we're going to show you what these six instruments uh, look like that are the most vital parts of what we do in flying when you're flying with when you can't see out of the window. So we're going to go through these instruments just briefly so you understand why I'm using this as an example. So the first one in the top left hand corner is how fast you're going. This is your speed. Now when you're in an airplane you're flying along in the air you need speed because if you don't have speed you're going to fall out of the sky unless you're a helicopter. So you really and we're not talking about helicopters today so this is a very important instrument because if you don't have any speed you're not staying up for very long. The one below that in the bottom left-hand corner is the turn coordinator, and that's similar to what Doolittle had in his plane. It's very basic. It just has a little picture of an airplane, and if it's rocking from one side to the other, it means you're turning, and that gives you some indication of that. But it's very, it doesn't really give you a huge amount of information other than that. So the one in the middle and the bottom is like a compass. This is kind of a more visual depiction of what a compass is showing us. So that tells you what direction you're going in. And if you're in a plane and you want to go from A to B, you kind of need to know which direction you're going in because otherwise you're just flying around in circles. <laughs> then the one next to that on the bottom right is called the vertical speed indicator. It has this little needle that's basically pointing straight out. That means that you are not climbing, you are not descending, you are just staying level exactly where you are. If it goes up, then you know you're climbing. If it goes down, you know you're heading towards the ground. Then the one above that is the altimeter. That basically tells, this is very important because if you're flying, you don't want to be on the ground, you want to be above the ground. So <laughs> this tells you how far above the ground you are. Well, actually it tells you how far above sea level you are. That's important because if you're flying in this area and you're heading that direction, there are mountains over there. If you're flying over the sea, that's fine. If you're flying in that direction, there's mountains. And the mountains are higher than 3,000 feet. So you're gonna, this says 3,000 feet right there. So you know that you need to be higher than the highest part of the mountain in order to get over it. A lot of people have found out that the hard way. <laughs> so that's, that's the top round. So that's a very important one. And I know I've missed out this one in the middle, and this is really important. This is what we call the artificial horizon. This is kind of a visual depiction of what you would see if it was daylight outside, a nice sunny day, and you would see that out the front window. So that's probably the most useful one in everybody's eyes because that's like you're just looking outside. And they keep it really simple for pilots because they say, okay, the blue bit is the sky and the brown is the ground. So keep that in the middle and you'll be fine. So that's, that's one that one. And so that's probably the most clear picture that you can get uh, out of all the instruments. Um, so between them all, you get a really good picture of what you're doing when you're flying along and you can't see out the window. And you need to combine them all uh, in order to get the full picture. So what does this have to do with this morning's message? Well, we will face inevitable storms of life. And we cannot always see a way through these storms of life. And it's like we're flying along and everything is bright and everything is sunny, but before long the clouds begin to close in on us. And they seem to be closing in and closing in and they're getting darker and darker and before long we feel very lost. We can't see where we're going, and we are literally flying blind. And something that happens to you when you get in this situation as a pilot is that you get what's called spatial disorientation. The weird thing is that when you can no longer see the horizon, and you no longer see the sky and the ground separated in a nice clear picture in front of you, 
your body starts to do really weird things to your feelings, you start to change, and you, you just begin to feel like you're doing things that you're not. And you, your body starts tricking you. It plays tricks on you, and you have no idea you are turning when you are. You think you're just flying along, but actually you're turning at quite a steep rate. You could be descending very quickly, but you feel like everything's just fine. So your body is very difficult to read during these circumstances. Even when you're in a simulator, some of these simulators just sit on the ground. They don't even, they're not up on stilts, they don't move, or any of those fancy ones like that. Some of them just sit on the ground, and even when you're flying those, you feel like you're turning or doing, your body starts playing tricks on you based on the input that you're giving it. And it's just, it's a very weird sensation. So it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, to get spatial disorientation. So the key in this is to trust the instruments that you have in front of you, no matter what, whether you think it's telling the truth or not. There's a story about Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Patton, who was an F-15 pilot in Desert Storm. On the first night of the war, his mission was to escort a large formation of fighters over the northern part of Iraq to bomb a chemical um, weapon factory. The date that they chose for this particular flight was chosen on purpose because there was no moon, which meant it would be particularly dark, and there was some high cloud that would give them some cover from the Iraqi bases that were uh, just across the border. So he was flying in total darkness, and he, get, he became completely dependent on his instruments because he had nothing else to look at, no other references. So shortly after crossing the border into Iraq, a radar from one of the missile sites locked onto him. So he violently maneuvered his aircraft to try and shake the lock. And eventually he did. He broke the lock. They no longer had a missile lock on him. But all of these radical movements in the dark created a whole new problem for him. He was suffering from severe spatial disorientation. His mind was telling him that his plane was climbing in a right turn. That's what he felt like. His body felt like he was just climbing in a right turn. So his instinct at that point would be to correct that. But then when he looked at his instruments, he could see that he was descending at a particularly fast rate very dangerous fast rate. And you can imagine in F-15, every rate is fast, no matter what you're doing. So his mind was telling him to correct the plane, to lower the nose, to get it to a more level attitude. That's what his mind was telling him. His body was telling that. But he was flying in total darkness. So he quickly, realized, he quickly had to determine whether to trust his instruments or to trust his own instincts. His very life depended on making the correct choice. And even though it took everything in him to overcome what he was feeling, what his body was telling him, he decided to trust his instruments. So within a few seconds, he decided that he would pull the nose up. So he would bring the nose of the aircraft up, stop the, stop the descent. And pretty quickly, within a few moments, he realized that that was the right decision. Trusting his instruments saved his life. Doesn't matter what he was feeling. So he looked at the altimeter at that point. That's the one on the top there, tells you how high you are. And he realized that he was 2,000 feet away from hitting the Iraqi mountains. 2,000 feet sounds like a lot until you're in an F-15. Then that doesn't take long at all. So he was literally three seconds away from death if he had not trusted it in his instruments, if he had trusted what he felt was the right thing to do. I have a personal story that I'll tell you, which is when I was in flight school, I, was, I got my private pilot certificate. I got my instrument rating, which is when you learn how to fly with instruments and clouds and stuff like that. And I was, I was a fairly low-time pilot, and I was with a roommate, and he... His brother was coming into San Francisco, uh, or to Oakland, actually, and he asked me if I could go up to Oakland to pick up his brother because he hadn't got his license yet, and he was busy anyway, so he couldn't go. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. Any opportunity to go fly a plane. So I decided, we set the, well, I got all the details of the day that was supposed to do it, and I remember it was a Friday, and as Friday approached, we started looking at the weather, and things started looking a little dicey, and then when the day came, it was really dicey. There were storms coming down the state from the north, coming down the valley, and so... I had to make a decision on to whether to fly or not fly. I was 23, and I was a new pilot, and I thought, of course I could do this. I'm 23, and I'm a new pilot. I'm, I'm instrument-rated now. I am, they told me I could do this, so I'm going to do it. So on the day came. I took off. Everything was fine for a little while. About 30 miles out, I hit cloud, which is OK. You hit cloud. By the time I got to Oakland, and I'd be in cloud, I stayed in solid cloud, just like that picture we saw before. It's just like that, but darker, all the way up there. And by the time I got to Oakland, it was night. And so I, I broke out of the clouds just before I landed in Oakland, and I was relieved to get there. I was exhausted. It was tiring. Doing it on your own, there's no autopilot in these small planes, and all, you have to look at all the instruments and the GPS and all that kind of stuff to make sure you're on track. So I was tired when I got there. And then I met the, this, my roommate's brother. He was much bigger than I expected and a lot heavier than I expected. 
He was also had a lot more luggage than I expected. So we, and I was in a small plane. So we crammed all this stuff into the plane. He got into the plane. And I wasn't about to say, I don't think the weather's too bad. I don't think we should go. Because I was 23 and I was a new. <laughs> Nothing kills you when you're 23. So I was like, OK, we can do this. Plus, I told him I would bring him home. So, you know. So we took off. And uh, once we took off, we went into cloud pretty quickly, and then air traffic control routed me down the coastal side because they wanted to get me out of the way of San Francisco because there's a lot of traffic going on around there. So I went down the side, down the coast, and we were over Santa Cruz, and they said to me, oh, we would really like it, air traffic control said, we'd really like it if you could get to the altitude that we've asked you to be at because that's what you're supposed to do. And so I said, oh, it's great, I will put it on my wish list because I'm trying to get there right now. <laughs> The problem is that I have a lot more weight than I thought I would have. My plane didn't have as much power as I wanted it to have, and the, the wind inside the clouds was pushing me down. So I was literally trying to climb the whole time, and I was not getting anywhere at all, which is you start to panic a little bit at that point. So they understood, and they said, OK, we'll just. So they kept me going down the coast until I got to a point where I could cross over the coastal mountains, um, no problem. But I was in cloud the whole way until about Madeira, I pulled out of cloud. And I was so relieved to see Fresno at that point. It was night, it was dark, and I was sweating like crazy. I was running out of adrenaline. This was one of the most intense flights ever in my life, still the most intense flight in my life. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the Pope when he gets to a country that he's never been to before. The first thing the Pope does is he comes down the stairs of the airplane and he kisses the ground of the, <laughs> of the airport right then and there, and that was exactly what I wanted to do when I got out of the plane. In Fresno, I was like, I'm so glad to be here. I, frankly, I don't know how I'm still alive. But I didn't share that, of course, with the roommate or the brother. I was just acted like it was an everyday occurrence. What I did learn was that really uh, you should take weather a lot more seriously as a pilot. And, uh, and after that, that experience, I really was much more careful uh, what I did as far as weather goes. Um, part of the problem is that I spent so much time, hours and in a plane just fighting my instincts. And that's why it's so exhausting, because you're sitting there watching all these instruments, all these six instruments plus the GPS, and you're trying to fight your instincts to do one thing because your instruments are telling you to do another. And that can get very tiring. And you just, after a while, you just feel like it. This doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right that, I'm, that my instruments are saying this, because my body just tells me something completely different. Uh, so, and it's challenging at first. But after you do this sort of stuff for a, lo uh, for a long period of time, then you do get used to it. So don't worry that pilots are sitting up front of the airline, sweating it out and running out of adrenaline. These guys have autopilot, and they have a lot of experience. So they know what, they know what to expect. I did not have autopilot. So the hardest thing to do when you're training is to get to that point where it you, you, doesn't matter what you feel. It's about what the instruments say. And that's, they're the ones that are telling you exactly what is going on. And it's important as you fly along to keep looking at all the instruments to get the very clear picture. You need to look at them all, just not one of them. And in order to get the best picture of what the flight looks like, you need to look at all of them in a certain way. And we have another slide for that, which is uh, it'll show you a certain way that you're supposed to look at these instruments. And it might be hard to see, but those are arrows with, on both ends of those lines. And so what you need to do when you're flying along is you, you start with the one in the middle center, because I told you this is the most useful picture that you can have, because this kind of gives you a quick at a glance, visual picture of where you're at. Then you look across to the next one. That's your speed. Then you look back to that one. Then you look down to that one. You look back to that one. So you're always going back to the one in the middle. So you can look at all of them, but you're always going back to the one in the middle because that gives you the most, the most clear and quick picture of what's going on, the most visual idea of whether you are turning or whether you're descending, whether you're climbing, or whether you're upside down or the right side up. So it gives you right, the quick reference on that. So each time you look at the others, you go back to the middle. There's another name for the one in the middle. It's not just the artificial horizon. It's actually called an attitude indicator. It's an indicator of your attitude. And I know what you're thinking. Well, most pilots' attitudes, I've met them. They're pretty darn confident people. Not that kind of attitude. We're talking about attitude in flying, which is whether your wings are straight, whether, like, whether you're turning, whether you're going up or down or upside down. That's your attitude when it comes to flying. So you still with me on all this? I know. OK, good. <laughs> just checking. So, because I'm about to get to the point. <laughs> so, this is, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, what if we were to replace these six instruments with the next slide with these six circles, or at least these are a depiction of six circles uh, in our lives? 
See, I told you I'd get to the point already. <laughs> but I know you feel richer for the experience of listening to everything before this. So now we've seen our instruments have been replaced with these particular things in our life. And you'll see that Jesus, we sang Jesus is the center. Well, Jesus is the center right there. He should be the hub of our lives and everything that we do in our lives. It should revolve around him. But we also need to keep the same scan. You'll notice that there's still the arrows pointing to each one. So what we need to do is we go to Jesus and then we, we check on our kids. We address stuff that's going on with our kids. But then we go back to Jesus. Then we go to our friends. Then we go back to Jesus. We go to our spouse. We go back to Jesus. So each time we need to revisit Jesus. And it goes on and on in all the different categories in our lives. And these are just an example of some of the categories in our lives. So scanning becomes an important thing when it comes to having Jesus in our life. Because the truth is, we don't know what is coming up in our lives. We don't know what we're flying into. And we're flying blind because we cannot see into the future. We like to think we can sometimes, but then we get these curveballs that we weren't expecting. So we cannot, for 100% sure, know what we're going into in the future. And sometimes we might see more and more circles appearing. Suddenly it gets very crowded. There's a lot of different circles in our lives. And then what happens? We forget to look at the circle in the middle. Because all the others are gaining our attention through harassing us. Whether it's your boss asking for more and more work from you, being more and more demanding, then you tend to focus more on that. Or your kids are always like, at you about something. They want something. They need something. So they're always, you hear them. And then your spouse is asking for your attention. So that, but Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus is there, and we need to seek him. So he's not constantly tugging at our sleeve like everything else. And what happens is when we get into a situation in our lives where there's just too much going on, we forget to look at the middle circle. And we forget to go back to the middle circle. We just go from one to the other to the other, trying to put out all the fires that are going on in our lives. And we forget. It's also, if you notice, Jesus is in a bigger circle. And this is not just because I'm inept with computers and that I, need to, I couldn't do all the circles the same size. I put Jesus as a bigger circle on purpose. Because it's the most important. It's that simple. There's nothing complicated about this. Well, what happens sometimes is that we get the things in our lives that become more important. They become a bigger circle. They start growing and growing and growing and crowding out all the other circles around us. And it's very easy to do that with kids. When you have kids, things can get very busy because Jane, Johnny, Jacob, Jezebel, I don't think people call their kids Jezebel, probably not a good idea. They, they want your attention. They need to get to the softball. They need to get to soccer. They need to get to Lego robotics, to plays, to cheer, to bands, everything else that goes on in kids' lives, and the list is never-ending. And all this stuff is good. It really does enrich kids' lives, and it really helps them to develop in so many different ways. But the problem is, when we focus on one thing, it becomes huge, and everything else begins to shrink away. And if everything else, if everything becomes about kids, then suddenly our spouse circle starts shrinking. And suddenly you realize that there might be problems creeping in in your marriage, that there may be issues you had before becoming more mag magnified because there's just too much going on in other areas and you're not addressing what needs to be addressed. If, when you're newlyweds, your spouse circle becomes really big because you're newlyweds and you just want to spend all your time with your spouse and then everybody, your friends start calling you going, where are you? I haven't seen you in a long time. And your boss is saying, get your head back in the game. You're never at work. I don't understand what you're doing. And so it just happens like that, and these things get so big and because you're focusing on one thing. And it's easy as a pilot. You can focus on one thing. You can focus on the altitude that you're at. You can say, okay, this is important. Don't want to hit the ground. So I'm going to focus on what altitude I'm at. And you could do that really well. You can stay at 5,000 feet very, very well. The problem is you might be flying around and around in circles because you don't know what direction you're going in because you haven't looked at all the other instruments. So it's easy to focus on one and do that well but everything else is starting to break. So it's about balance. But the Jesus circle must remain in the center because we find that the circle gives us the most clear picture in our lives. And it's just like the attitude indicator in the airplane. It tells us what's up from down. It tells us what's left from right. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. And that's our key verse for this morning. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In the same way that pilots find to rough weather, they, they, they shouldn't lean on their own understanding. They should be able to figure out that Jesus is the way to go and that that will help us to get a, a much straighter path. We lean on our own understanding. We're not trusting in God. We're not trusting in the instruments. 
And we submit in every way to him and we trust him. We forge ahead with Jesus in our hearts, Jesus in our minds. And we use him to help us navigate. And Solomon tells us that this proverb will make our path straight. We don't have to worry about where we are heading if we use the instrument that God has built into us. So let's add GPS to the mix. On this, beyond the, the six instruments, there's a GPS on the side. The GPS literally has a little line on it. And that's the route we need to take. And there's a little airplane on it. And sometimes it's going all over the place. But there's still the line in the middle. And it's going all over the place because sometimes we're just not very good at flying. And so, you know, you just can't stay on a straight line. And other times there's outside forces that are pushing you off that line. And sometimes it can be air traffic control telling you you need to go a different route, but they'll get back on line. Um, or it might be stronger winds than you're expecting, pushing you off course without you realizing it. So you need to know what your route is. And there are times when you go off route, you see the line, you know you're supposed to be there, you've strayed off it, but you're still there and you need to get back onto it. And again, if we switch out the global positioning system, the GPS, with the God positioning system, still GPS, and God, way has a, God has a pathway in our lives. And if we stray, sometimes we stray because sin and temptation helps us to stray off that line. It's outside forces pushing us away from where we need to be going. Temptation and sin is the, the biggest culprit for that. But we need to get back online. But whatever it is, the pathway, the route, it stays there, and we are the ones wavering around it because God has a path for us, and it is set. We use instruments that God gives us to help us get back to it. We need to measure our spiritual attitude. It's like the attitude indicator. Jesus is the indicator of our spiritual attitude. And what is the correct attitude that we should have as Christians? Well, Galatians 5 is always a good go-to if you want to understand what the attitude that we should be displaying as Christians is. And that says, by the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So if we check our attitude against the attitude indicator, Jesus, and we apply that to all the other areas of our lives, and we keep going back to that one attitude indicator, then we will be more successful. There's a story in chapter 4 of Mark where it says where Jesus is in a boat and a furious squall comes up in verse 37 and the, wind, the waves broke over the boat so that the boat was nearly swamped and Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up and rebuked the wind. He said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still not have faith? They were terrified. But the storm whipped up while Jesus and his disciples were at sea. This is the storm, like storms in life. The disciples woke Jesus because Jesus was, was asleep during this major storm. And he rebuked the wind like a, like a parent to a child. He rebuked it and immediately it stopped. Although the children don't always just stop when you tell them to. So how is it that Jesus could sleep in a boat during a major storm? It's because he trusted his father, his spiritual sense was just right. Everything was at peace in God's universe. It doesn't matter if there's a huge storm going on around. It doesn't matter. Everything is at peace in God's universe. It doesn't matter what the physical outside references are telling us. So if we look to Jesus' our attitude indicator, as the disciples should have looked to Jesus as their attitude indicator, and they should have modeled their own attitude with that of Jesus, because, and then they wouldn't have become so afraid so quickly about the storm. A pilot can take off on a clear, sunny day and encounter clouds. And those that are not familiar with how to use the instruments, those that are not trained, are going to get into a panic pretty quickly because they know it's a dangerous situation. But just as pilots are trained, they need to practice using the instruments. We need to practice and exercise our spiritual faith every day so that we become so much easier. It becomes so much easier for us to be able to trust in God without thinking about it. It becomes a lot less effort. So that first flight, looking at instruments where everything is crazy about you and you're panicking and sweating, the next time it becomes a little easier and the next time it comes a little easier. Why? Because you keep practicing and practicing. The same is true with our spiritual lives. The instruments in the airplane are built in. They are inside there. They're right in front of you. And in the same way, spiritual instruments are built in us. And how are they built in us? Through the Holy Spirit. Some practical advice on this is we can rely on our GPS, the God positioning system, through the Holy Spirit. This is one of the 
this is the one part of the Trinity that gets easily left out so many times. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so many times people are confused by the Holy Spirit. They're not sure, so they just ignore it. But in John 14, it says, If you love me, keep my commands. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. And then later on it says, he lives with you and he lives in you. Built-in instruments to help you get through life. Jesus is saying to his disciples that even though he was physically leaving the world through his death, through his resurrection, and ultimately his ascension, he will leave behind the Holy Spirit, an advocate for us. And he will live in us and he will be with us all the time. He can't physically be here, but the Holy Spirit can be. And how does it help us? Well, it tells us in John 16, verse 13, it says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you with full truth. How does it guide us? Well, it teaches us so that we know what we're supposed to be doing, what course we're supposed to be on. Then we know which direction we're supposed to be heading in. It rebukes us if we get off course. So if we get pushed off course by sin and temptation or other outside forces, it rebukes us. The Holy Spirit brings us back, and then it corrects us, brings us back onto the, onto the right course, and then it teaches us so that we can stay on the right course. And it says this in 2 Timothy 3. It says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. Thoroughly equipped. Like an airplane is equipped with instruments, so we are thoroughly equipped for every good work. Like Doolittle's navigation instruments guiding his plane, listening to the Holy Spirit and reading the Word of God can be our navigation, our instruments for life. If we listen to the Holy Spirit and not block it from our lives and push it away from us, if we listen to and embrace the Holy Spirit in all of our actions and we follow God's word, then he will guide us. And if we're honest, most of us just fly through life blind. We must admit that we need to have faith in God because God can see what we cannot see. God can see what's going to happen. God can see the storms before we ever do and he will guide us through the storm and he has given us the tools to stay upright no matter what we feel might be happening, he has given us the tools to understand whether we are going in the right direction, when we're at the right altitude, if we're doing the right thing, because his word and his Holy Spirit are a, com a vital combination in our lives, and we need to keep Jesus at the center of all of the things that happen in our everyday lives. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the word that you have given us. We thank you for the ability for us to know which direction we're supposed to be going in, and we ask for the wisdom to be able to follow it. Lord, open our eyes to see what it is that you want us to do, to embrace the Holy Spirit, and to be able to head in the right direction, to use all of the tools at our disposal and apply them to every area of our lives, Lord. And we just pray that if things get too busy in our lives, that we will try and simplify so that we can still check in with you all the time, putting you as the hub and the center of our lives so that we can understand everything else in our life is what is, what is going on in our lives. And Lord, we just know that you are the most complete picture of what we are supposed to do. So Lord, give us wisdom to understand what we are supposed to do. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word, for the map, for the tools that we have. We just pray that we use it. In Jesus' name we pray. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.